The ocean and our biosphere are changing and having data from the past is our only way of understanding the context of that change. Hopkins Marine Station has been here for over a hundred years. The observations and the data that we have here in Miller Library are some of the only keys we have to understanding how the environment here is changing. We're watching climate change happen in real time in front of us through the observations that we make here in the intertidal at Hopkins Marine Station or out on research vessels out on Monterey Bay or out in the Pacific Ocean. And so the way that we're able to realize or understand the changes as they're happening is by comparing what we can see now and measure now uh, with what we've observed in the past. One of the first data sets that I was excited to work with when I, after I started my job here at Miller Library is something that I actually had been wanting to work on since I came for my interview. I was going on a tour of the library as a part of the, the day and we came in here into the special collections room and I happened to notice uh, a whole section of rusty three ring binders. And that caught my eye because it's an unusual thing to be in a room with, with a bunch of old books. And I asked the librarian if I could take a look and it turns out that these were binders of oceanographic data from cruises that had taken place out in Monterey Bay every week in the 50s and 60s and 70s. So decades of oceanographic data. I asked the librarian at the time if these data had ever been shared or put out into the world and he said no, not as far as he was aware. And it, it was at that moment that I knew I had to get this job so that I could work in, in getting these data out into the world. And then that became my first digitization project. Digitization is just the first step. You have to go to the next step, which is actually pulling the data out from the digitized papers and getting them in a format that researchers can use, which is more often something like spreadsheets. So in the case of the oceanographic data, one thing that I really wanted to look at was the time series of plankton. And plankton are tiny plants and animals that form the base of the marine food web. And we had all of this data from these cruises that tracked uh, both phytoplankton, which are plants, and zooplankton, which are animals, over time. So being able to get this data out into the world would help researchers understand how the biology of the base of the food chain in Monterey Bay was changing over the course of a couple of decades. So in this case, because the data was not typed, it was handwritten logs, data logs, where people had counted the plankton, I turned to crowdsourcing to help. And we set up two crowdsourcing campaigns to um, free the data, liberate the data from the phytoplankton and the zooplankton data sets. The crowdsourcing campaign involved hundreds of pages of plankton data, dozens of volunteers who put in hundreds of hours to meticulously go through and extract observations from the page to get them into a digital format that we could use. And I'm just thrilled this is a process that worked extremely well for us. All of the data has been extracted and transcribed, and we're moving on to next steps to share the data through the Stanford Digital Repository. Let me share with you another project where historical data played a vital role in discovery of changes to our local ecosystem as a result of climate change. In the spring of 1993, two undergraduate students who were studying out at Hopkins Marine Station decided to do a research project where they went out to the inner tidal at Hopkins and they resampled a transect line that had first been sampled in the early 1930s. The goal of their short research paper was to see if they could detect any change in the species contribution from the 1930s to the 1990s. And they only had 10 weeks, and so it was a short project. But even in that short amount of time, they were able to detect changes in the species composition that were correlated with the temperature time series that we also have here at the Marine Station. And this started uh, a series of experiments where one of the students, Rafe Sagrin, came back and resampled the line again collected more data and showed definitively for the first time that climate change was affecting species distribution in the marine environment. And this was, for an undergraduate student, a huge accomplishment and very exciting. And just a couple years later, President Bill Clinton and Vice President Al Gore came out to visit the Marine Station and meet with Rafe to see the location where he had done that work. 
when I was a postdoctoral researcher here a few years ago, one of the projects that I started uh, was inspired by work by Rafe Sagarin and Sarah Gilman, who studied uh, the Hewitt transect initiated by Willis Hewitt in the 1930s. I was inspired by, by their work, and I decided to search for the effects of climate change on the rocky shore, but in a different way. And specifically, I was interested in how the body sizes of the local shore invertebrates have changed over over time, over the past 60 or 70 years. And I relied on the student papers because they provided this incredible uh, repository of information on body sizes of, of gastropods or, or snails. And by using those historical size distributions, I was then able to go out and resample the same areas and basically demonstrate uh, overall that there's been a 20% reduction in the body size of three different species of snails on our rocky shore. The challenge, of course, is that observations of species, temperature, environmental variables, they're locked up in these papers in our library. And I had to come up with a plan for getting the data out in a format that researchers could use. So again, just like with the oceanographic data, our first step was digitizing the papers. I got some internal funding, I used some gift funding and put those together and we were able to scan 746 Hopkins Marine Station student papers spanning 50 years of time. The challenge with having such a large set of student papers is that you can't, one person can't read them, of course, to get all of the data out fast enough to be able to use it effectively. So what we do instead is turn to computational methods like text mining, natural language processing. I'm partnering with developers in Stanford libraries to come up with a process for using AI and machine learning to pull out relevant data from the student papers that we can then share with researchers who are interested in studying things like rain shifts of marine species or shifts in biodiversity with time. In the context of climate change and changes in biodiversity, the ability to make old data new again or to bring old data to life is really what drives me to digitize these collections and try and make them available. So both in the case of the oceanographic data from Monterey Bay and the student papers here from Hopkins Marine Station, really bringing new life into old data is the crux of what we're trying to do.